Our scripture today is Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. 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 Man, I love that, that song. I'm glad we could share that with you today. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts, open our minds to receive from you your word, which is truth, which is gospel truth. Lord, awaken our minds to understand more about who you are and more about who we are this day. Give us the grace of self-forgetfulness and give us the grace of faith to believe and trust in you more and more today. Make us more aware of your glory. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I love weddings. I love being up front during weddings as the pastor standing before the congregation because it is truly the best seat in the house. It is a front row seat for glory. One of the best moments in a wedding is when the bride first appears at the back of the room. Everyone stands, and the glory of the bride fills the room. Something great is happening, and everyone can feel it down deep in their heart. They can feel what's happening, and so we rise and we experience the weight of glory. But that's not the best part. The best part is what most people miss. The best part is the bridegroom's face. The best part is when I get to turn and look at the man standing beside me and watch his face express pure delight, pure joy, pure happiness, pure glory. This is doxology. It, it's, a, it's a reaction to the glory of the moment. Doxa is the word glory and logi is, is a response to glory. A word of glory. Doxology is a reaction to glory. And maybe you've experienced it in a wedding like I have. Or maybe you've experienced it when you witness a majestic sunset. Or maybe you've experienced it when your team makes an incredible play. Or maybe you've experienced it when you're on a roller coaster and you begin to go down the other side of the hill. You experience doxology. Maybe you've experienced it when a magician makes his assistant disappear. That moment of glory and our response to that glory is doxology, a reaction to glory. A doxology is a reaction to the things that are stunning. A doxology is a reaction to things that we don't fully understand. Doxology is a reaction to things that are just out of our control. 
the glory, a reaction to glory. That is where 11 chapters of Romans have brought us. 11 chapters of Romans have brought us to the sunset. To the bride walking down the aisle. To the, to the last second jump shot. To the top of the hill. Doxology is the response to all that God is doing. All that God has said. All that God has put on display for us in this letter so far. And so as we continue in this glory, in this understanding of glory, we're going to kind of review what has God said about His glory? What has given us a display of this? And so we're going to walk through the whole book of Romans quickly. Just an overview, a snapshot of where we've been. What is the glory? All right. so in chapters 1 through 3, we realize that we have all fallen short of what? God's glory. We have all fallen short of God's glory because of sin. Because we have rejected God as God, and we have said, no, I would rather serve myself. I would rather serve the created thing instead of the creature. And we are all without excuse. Romans 3, 23 reads, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's the bad news. And then in chapters 4 and 5, we move into this message that we can now access God's glory, which we've rejected. We can now access it through God's grace. We can now access it in a new way. No longer through the law. The law brought condemnation. The law brought awareness that we're messed up. That we blew it. And now God reveals a new way to be righteous. Grace. The free gift of God's righteousness. Through faith we are forgiven and made right. This is the glory of God. Romans 5 verse 2. And if you have it, uh, Laurie, if you could pull it up on the screen. My remote's not working. Romans 5 verse 2 says, Through Him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the, of the glory of God. Through Him, through Christ, we have access to the grace and the glory of God. The letter continues into chapter 6 and 8 with the question, so what? And in chapter 6 and 8, we hear that not only have we received God's grace and His glory, but now we can live for God's glory by the Spirit of God. We can live for God's glory because God has sent His Spirit to indwell our hearts through faith that we can now live for Him. We can be a people who have been set free from the bondage to sin and death. And we can live for Him now. We can actually walk with Him as a people who are free. And yes, the struggle is real. Romans 7, the struggle against sin is real. But Romans 8, God's Spirit gives us strength and new life. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the that is to be revealed to us. You see what God is doing? God is moving us from glory to glory. God is moving us from grace to to grace. He's transforming us and He's moving us. Romans 1 through 8. Sin, redemption, transformation. And then in chapters 9 through 11, it's a parenthesis. It's a parenthesis in, in, this, in, this, in this argument, in this discussion of God's glory. And the parenthesis says this, that you can ask God hard questions about His glory. That you can ask God hard questions. And Paul asks the questions on everyone's mind. Has God's word failed the people of Israel? Has God abandoned his people? And, and absolutely, God says, no. 
God says no through the word of Romans 9 and 10 and 11 and this message of redemption and salvation as it unfolds. It brings to the conclusion these deep gospel mysteries of of hardening and of election that God would somehow consign some to disobedience, actually all to disobedience, in order that He might open up the possibility to save the world. That's what we read about last week, isn't it? That, 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 That the Gentiles, that the nations could be grafted into God's tree. And the last word in verse 32, if you have that, verse 32, it says this. He ends this entire section with these words, that God may have mercy on all. And this phrase, that God might have mercy on all, is the expression of God's glory that causes Paul to drop everything and to break into song. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. How inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of our God? Who has been His counselor? Who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Do you see how God has has brought us this far? Doxology is a reaction to glory. Doxology is a reaction to glory. Let's walk through this doxology. Verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments. How inscrutable His ways. The first word here is an exclamation. Oh. It's, it's like he's saying, Oh, God! God! It's like he's saying, wow. It's like he's saying, look. Right? It it begins with an exclamation. It's that moment of doxology. It's that moment of of response to the glory of God. It's emotional. It's uncontrolled reaction to the glory that he's witnessed. Oh, the depth of his riches. God owns everything. Oh, the depth of his wisdom. God works all things together for good. Oh, the depths of his knowledge. God knows and organizes every detail of everything. His judgments are unsearchable. We can't fully know what God is thinking. We can't fully know why, because His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We can't know we're not God. God is God. And there is none like Him. There is none like... As soon as you put God in a box, He won't stay there. As soon as you put God in a box, He won't stay there. How inscrutable are His ways. It means His ways can't be tracked. It means you can't track God. It means you can't trace His paths. Right? But you can trust His paths. You can follow Him even when you don't know where He's going. You can follow Him even when you don't know where He's going. God is transcendent. It means that He is distinct. From his creation. He is not in his creation. He is not in the trees. He is not in any of us except by his spirit. But God exists outside of his creation, creator creation. All right, we got to get that right. God is transcendent. He is utterly unique. There is no one like God. If you, try to put, if you try to figure Him out, you will not fully understand God. That's what Paul is saying here. That's what he's responding and saying, I don't get it. I don't get it. Praise your name. He continues in verse 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? 
Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? See, these, these rhetorical questions pop up, and they don't pop up out of nowhere. Do you know where they pop up from? They pop up from a little boy named Paul. A little boy named Paul who growing up memorized Scripture. These are quotes from the Old Testament. And as Paul is glorifying God, he's remembering things that he learned as a little boy. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? He's quoting Isaiah and Job. And in the context, Isaiah is reacting to the glory of God's promise to bring comfort to his people after a long period of suffering. And in the context, Job is reacting to the glory of God in light of Job's own personal tragedy and suffering. Who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? You see, both of these expressions of God's glory are founded and rooted in deep pain, deep loss, deep suffering. And sometimes our suffering can be a barrier to doxology. Sometimes our suffering and our pain in life, little or big, sometimes it's the little things that really become a barrier to doxology. When we experience loss and pain, we question God. Not that we can't ask God questions, but we question God, sometimes in sinful ways, because we think we could do a better job managing the universe. Thank you very much. This week, I told God, in a sinful moment, I could do this better than you. And maybe you didn't say it like I did. What unbelief. And yet, God meets us in the middle of the hard things. And the hard things don't have to harden you. The hard things don't have to harden you. They don't have to make your faith crumble. They don't have to make us dig in our heels of unbelief. Job was tested in this way. And if we look at the earlier context from the book of Job, Job arises. In Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, he arises and he tears his robe and he shaves his head and he falls to the ground and he worships God. And he says to God these incredible words, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, for believers, for those who have the Spirit of God, suffering becomes a backdrop for witnessing the glory of God. Let me say that again. For believers, suffering becomes a backdrop for witnessing the glory of God And I know that that sounds good. But brothers and sisters, you have access to God's grace in your suffering. Believe Him. Trust Him again. Paul, the the singer concludes his doxology with these words, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. With three tiny prepositions, from, through, for, Paul describes the absolute greatness and glory of God. With three tiny prepositions, all things are from Him. He is the Creator, the origin. He is the one to whom we owe our very existence. All things are from Him. All things are through Him. He is 
actively sustaining everything in creation from the tiniest particle to the largest solar system. God is sustaining it all. It is all through Him. And not only is it from Him and through Him, but it is to Him. Everything, 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 you and me and everything, the chair you're sitting in, the building we're sitting in, the community that we're in, everything is for Him. Everything finds its ultimate purpose in Him. In God's service. Our ultimate reason for being is to be in His presence. To know God intimately, to know Him increasingly, that all the glory belongs to God. We sing that song, all the glory belongs to You, all the glory belongs to You, O God. All the praise, all the majesty, all the expressions of thanks and the words of adoration, the glory belongs to God. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Doxology is a reaction to things that are stunning. Doxology is a reaction to things that we don't fully understand. Doxology is a reaction to things that are out of our control. Doxology is a reaction to glory. I don't normally do long quotes. But one of my favorite historical expressions of the glory of God was written by a group of English pastors in the 17th century. And they make up the second chapter of a document called the Westminster Confession of Faith. I'm going to read you this description of our God. There is only one living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection. He is most pure spirit, invisible, with neither body parts nor passive properties. He is unchangeable, boundless, eternal, and incomprehensible. He is almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, and most absolute. He works all things according to the counsel of His own unchangeable and most righteous will for His own glory. He is most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. And He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, He is also most just and terrifying in His judgments, hating all sin, and will by no means acquit the guilty. God has all life, glory, goodness, and blessedness in and of Himself. He alone is all-sufficient in and to Himself, not standing in need of any creature which He has made, not deriving any glory from them, but rather manifesting His glory in, by, to, and on them. He alone is the fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. He is absolute sovereign over them to do by them, for them, or upon them whatever He pleases. In His sight, all things are open and manifest His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent of His creatures, so that nothing to Him is contingent or uncertain. God is most holy in all His counsels, in all His works, and in all His commands to Him is due from angels and men and every other creature, whatever worship, service, or obedience He is pleased to require of them. I can't help but read that and think about how big God is. How great He is. How glorious He is. And how do we respond to that? Doxology. How do we respond to who God is? Doxology. I want to end by telling you a story 
about a boy named Johnny. During the summer before my senior year in college, I interned with a traveling evangelist named Michael Holt. Michael uh, is an incredible communicator of gospel truth, especially to young people because he connects it to his own experiences of pain and loss and struggle. And I will never forget an experience we shared that summer in meeting a 12-year-old boy in a youth camp in Tennessee. I think it was the first day of the camp and this 12-year-old boy came up to me and Michael after the morning worship service and he wanted to talk. We could tell it was heavy. So we sat down and Johnny opened up. He told us about the deep pain that was in his heart that he couldn't put words to. He couldn't explain it. Michael shared with him in a personal way the message of God's sacrifice in the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross to defeat evil and to make a way of redemption through faith. I remember him saying, by his wounds you are healed. And that morning, Johnny expressed a newfound faith in Jesus as his Savior. The glory of God was breaking through before our eyes. And at that moment, he began to weep. And so Michael, to follow up, was probing him deeply about with questions, gentle questions. And Johnny began to share something about his present and his past. He began to share haunting details about being sexually abused and molested by strangers. And our hearts were ripped as he shared this unthinkable story of child abuse. We prayed for him. We communicated what needed to be communicated to his leaders. And as the camp continued that week, there was a newfound reality to what God was doing. That God was really reaching and really ministering to people. And I'll never forget on the last night of the camp, that evening after the meeting, the students were asked to go out into the campground to spend time seeking God's face in prayer. And it was quiet for 10, 15 minutes. And then a single voice rose out among the trees. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Doxology is a response to glory. Even from the lips of a broken and wounded 12-year-old boy. So how should we respond? We should respond like Johnny. 
right? We should respond like the bridegroom. We should respond like the people of Jerusalem when Jesus came into the town riding on the back of a donkey. Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Hosanna in the highest. Look at the glory of God. His character, His greatness, consider how in need of Him we are, how much we need His grace, how much we need His forgiveness, how much we need His healing touch. Don't be afraid to ask God hard questions. And trust Him. Trust Him more and more. Trust Him more and more. Meditate on the riches of His kindness and the depths of His incomprehensible grace and glory. Let yourself react. Let yourself react to the glory of God. Doxology. Doxology. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this expression of glory, this doxology. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have brought us through an understanding of who we are and and an understanding of your grace and an understanding of your transforming power by the Spirit. And God, we pray that this doxology would not just be words on a page, that it would not just be a message on a Sunday, but that it would transform us and transport us into people who live lives of doxology. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.